I'm standing next to a Japanese Nakajima built uh, A6M2 Zero fighter. Uh, this airplane was built under license uh, by Nakajima, constructed in April of 1943. An agreement was made in 2007 with an Australian company to uh, get this aircraft removed from the uninhabited island of Balalae uh, in the Solomon Islands to Australia, which was a, a very arduous, difficult task. Through an agreement back in 2007, it, along with uh, 11 other Japanese airplanes, were legally removed through an agreement with the government of the Solomon Islands. Uh, but that was a big deal back then. It took from 2007 to 2019 for these aircraft to then actually get to a point where they could be then taken off of this little tiny island in the middle of nowhere, uh, brought to Australia. There were four Japanese Zeros, Zero fighters, that were removed as a part of that grouping of aircraft. And one of them uh, went to Brisbane, Australia, one of them went to Japan, and, and this one right here in Zanesville, Ohio. From 2019, then it took another several years to get it to a point where it could be loaded on a ship in a 40-foot container and brought all the way across the Pacific into Mexico, around through the Panama Canal, up into Virginia to make port, then on a rail car from Virginia to Columbus, Ohio, then in a truck from Columbus, Ohio, here to Zanesville. The battle that then Japan lost in the air of the South Pacific took place in the Solomon Islands uh, and places like Papua New Guinea. And this was where this airplane was sent to directly uh, in 1943 to the 201st Kokutai Naval Air Group, uh, one of the greatest most elite frontline air units that saw more combat than probably any unit at any service of any theater of World War II. Uh, this airplane here would have been in active combat two to three missions a day. It was part of a unit that, that claimed over 460 confirmed victories uh, against Allied airplanes during that period. January 1944 saw this unit withdrawn from frontline service with almost no serviceable aircraft left to them and withdrawn to what was then at the time the, the rear of, of Saipan Island. Uh, these airfields again were frontline air bases. They were under attack by Allied aircraft every day. They were conducting missions, both defensive and offensive, against Allied aviation every day. And this particular aircraft here made an emergency landing on an island of Balalay, which is where we had recovered it from. Uh, by that time in the war, though, Balalay had been bypassed. That was General MacArthur's strategy of island hopping north all the way to Japan to the end of the war. So when this airplane had to make its forced landing, it was landing at a bypassed airfield surrounded by the enemy. It certainly wasn't this pilot's first choice. But he had received a 50 caliber bullet strike that went through the firewall uh, into the fuselage fuel tank, splintered, and then came out the other side. And this white stick here is how I show the trajectory of that of that shot. Now the pilot of this airplane, he would have relied on his fuselage tank uh, as the last tank that he would have switched to. The airplane had several fuel tanks. Uh, so certainly having received a, a bullet hole through this fuselage tank would have started leaking fuel into the cockpit, never a good situation under any circumstances, let alone combat. So he opted apparently instead of trying to make it home to put it down behind enemy lines at this emergency field where the airplane rested uh, virtually undisturbed for another 80 years. But to be able to see what brought this airplane down, certainly this was its last flight when it sustained this damage, it was never repaired. Uh, so the airplane sat there on Balalay for those decades upon decades. It's gonna be a long process, uh, getting the few elements that are, that are not originally present from the cockpit of this uh, Zero fighter but we're already starting to get some of the gauges in place. You know, we've got artificial horizon, we've got our turn and slip gauge, that radioactive radium. You don't want to sleep next to it at night. I would not advise that, but nevertheless, it shines as bright as it did 80 years ago uh, under the black light. But we're gonna get the instrument panel replaced. We're gonna get its other components uh, put in here. I already have most of the original gauges and boxes. They didn't use the, the Morris code all that often, but I opted to put it uh, back in where it would have, would have been placed. The machine guns would have protruded into the, into the cockpit here. You would have had your cocking handles on either side uh, to chamber your first round. Uh, the Japanese relied on their 7.7 .7 millimeter fuselage machine guns only really to, to uh, get the angle on a target 
Once they saw their traces hitting home, then they would switch the selector switch on the throttle quadrant, which is over here uh, on this side. They'd switch the selector switch and then the same trigger, the squeeze trigger, that would fire the machine guns would then also fire the 20 millimeter cannon in the wing. Japanese utilized a 20 millimeter cannon, one in each wing of this airplane would have been mounted here. The steel mounting brackets are still in place. The cannon barrel would stop at about here flush with the wing. It's funny, the Japanese, when it came to their military aviation industry, uh, they were very cognizant of appearances. So they like to use French curves on the wingtips. Even if that wasn't necessarily the best for the, the performance of the airplane, uh, the Japanese saw all of, all of their, even war material, through the lens of, of artists. And they didn't want the cannons to protrude from the wing because that's ugly. So they shaved it off here and e even though it made them a little less accurate, it was more in keeping with the smooth airframe. I was really excited to be able to uncover the actual original manufacturer serial number of this airplane. That's how I was able to determine when it was built, uh, where it served, uh, the units that it flew in. Uh, but it says 7830, Nakajima built, uh, carrier based type zero fighter. The first digit of the serial number was actually random. It was there to uh, confuse enemy intelligence. So if you omit the seven, this is actually the then 830th aircraft of this type built by Nakajima. When I was 10 years old, my father, who was everything to me uh, and still is, my father bought me a book uh, called Samurai by Fred Sato and Sakura Sakai. And when I was a little kid, Sakura Sakai, who uh, survived World War II as the highest scoring Japanese ace, kind of became my hero, which may seem strange from the perspective of an American. But I, I admired the courage of an individual putting circumstances that were not of his own choosing, fighting for a side that he didn't necessarily believe in politically, but because it was his duty to his people and his country and his family. So Sakai flew this aircraft, this aircraft type, A6M2 Model 21-0, and I want to thank everybody here for being a part of making this incredible lifelong dream come true. Thank you. Kampai. Kampai. It's one thing to own a piece of history like this, to own a warbird like this, uh, but it's another thing to be able to share it with everyone else in the world uh, who wants to share in it. And this is my artwork uh, of this particular aircraft with the correct tail code and markings in combat, uh, as we knew it, it performed in combat, with the piece of this aircraft uh, from its port wing, with the Japanese unique green uh, paint on it, History you can touch only from Cole's aircraft. <laughs>